Some folks would rather have houses and land. Some folks choose silver and gold. They treasure and forget about their souls. But I've decided to make Jesus, he's still my choice. One more time. Some folks would rather have houses and land. Some folks choose silver and gold. These things they treasure and forget about their souls. I decided to make Jesus my choice. We might as well make, wait, make one big choir. The road is rough. Come on, and the going gets tough.
Decide it. Decide it. Is that anybody's word other than mine? Through the tears, decide it. When I felt like giving up, decide it. When things looked mighty rough, decide it. Just touch somebody and say, I don't know about you, but I've decided to make Jesus, Jesus, my choice. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And now, God, we offer ourselves to you. And now, we ask, God, that you would be gracious as you always are. Provide a word, because we have decided. But God, we need you to encourage us this night that as we continue to walk, that we will truly walk by faith and not by sight. In your name we pray, and all the people of God said, amen. As you take your seat, Ellison Jones, is a sacred space, a space where both mind and heart find the central theme in worship. Ellison Jones is a place where we can come and be transparent and where we can allow God to both pour into us and pour from us. All of us here have breathed the breath of release, knowing that we made it home to Ellison Jones one more time. I give honor to God for handpicking me and for handpicking each of us to be in this space together. I honor my beloved Dean John Guns tonight. He's a man of God for this season in our life as a historically black theological institution. We pray tonight his strength as he guides and leads us to maintain our greatness as a seminary. It's been a decade since I preached at Ellison. The last time I preached at Ellison, I preached a sermon entitled Good News for Crazy People. I know, I know. Times have changed. I'm not sure I could preach that sermon tonight and be politically correct. But tonight I come with the same struggle that I had then. The struggle of the preacher who stands to offer a word that comforts, a word that confronts, and a word that calls all at the same time. I'm excited that we've come to sit for a few days under the theme, preaching and social justice, preaching liberation in perilous times. As products of the Samuel DeWitt Proctor School of Theology at Virginia Union University, social justice is our mantra. Social justice is the foundation of our ministry. Social justice is not just our conversation, it's our life's work. So tonight I want us to revisit a familiar text that I dabbled with in 2012 and which God called me to look at again for tonight. This familiar text in Luke's Gospel, the 10th chapter, talks about a man who is attacked as he leaves Jerusalem on his way to Jericho. He is ignored by a priest and ignored by a Levite. 
And then finally, he is helped by a Samaritan who not only bandages his wounds, but he takes him to the nearest inn, takes care of him, and pays the innkeeper to look after him until he returns. This story has encouraged all of us to be good Samaritans, to be that kind of person who will help the stranger, minister to those who have been hurt, and give to those in need. This is a powerful story that has informed and shaped our Christian faith. But this story has always left me with a lingering concern. What about the Jericho Road? It's good that we are being the good Samaritans that God calls us to be, ministering to the needy and the least and the left out, working to help those who are hurt and oppressed and ignored by society. But we can't afford to stop there. I don't know about anybody else, but I'm tired of bandaging up those who have been wounded on the Jericho roads of life. I truly believe that God is calling us to be about the business of dealing with the Jericho Road. When I first dealt with this text, I talked about transforming the Jericho Road. But as I looked at this text with fresh eyes and under the weight of our theme, preaching and social justice, preaching liberation in perilous times, I wanna preach tonight from the subject reimagining the Jericho Road. Imagination is powerful. Imagination is the power of forming a mental image of something not present, something not previously known, or something not previously experienced. In these perilous or dangerous times in which we live, when life has been turned upside down and when it appears as if we are walking in quicksand with boots on, sinking and falling, decreasing and losing the battle, not connecting and losing ground daily, what do we preach? What is preaching and social justice? How do we preach liberation and offer hope? Could it be that we are attempting to transform before we reimagine? I believe God is calling us, the church, the people of God, to reclaim our gift of imagination, to reclaim our gift of imagination. We've been trying to transform what we cannot imagine. We've been trying to fix what we cannot imagine being different. We've been trying to live a life that we can't imagine being any better than it is. Life as we know it has to be reimagined by those of us who have been touched by God, touched by God who has the power to do anything but fail. Those of us who have been touched by God who has all power, a God who knows everything, a God who is able to transform, and a God who is able to reorder, a God who can change and destroy and build up and create anew. So while the good work of bandaging up the wounded on the Jericho Road has to continue, we have to also reimagine the Jericho Road. Reimagine, see it again, take another look, See it with God's eyes. See this road called life differently because we can't transform what we can't imagine. We can't fix what we don't believe is possible. Social justice is the ability to see, not through the lenses of what happened or didn't happen before, not through the condition givens of this world, but see, see beyond what it is presently. We have to see it before we see it. We have to reimagine a road that's different from anything that we've seen before. And the only way we can reimagine is to see with the eyes of a God who creates all things new, even in these perilous times, when things are falling apart, when it's all upside down. We have to reimagine. We have to see what others cannot see. 
And as we stand in that sacred space before the people representing a God who makes all things possible, we can help them to reimagine a road where everybody can be safe and free and healed and delivered. First of all, we have to reimagine a road that's free of harm or harm free. It's good that we are being the good Samaritans that God calls us to be. It's good that we are ministering to the needy and the least and the left out. It's good that we are working to help those who are hurting and oppressed by society. I truly believe that the church does a good job with wound care. And even when we don't do a good job, it's not from lack of our trying. Wound care is a huge job. It's hard work and it's draining work because this life is one big Jericho road. People are attacked and robbed and wounded and killed daily. Everyday lives are put in danger on the Jericho road called life. Every day we are called to minister to the wounded. And the more we minister, the more wounded there are to minister to. But is it God's perfect will that we only minister to the wounded? Did God intend wound care to be the order of the day? Can that we wake up every morning and all day long wound care is our primary work? When Jesus said, the poor you will have with you always, was he relegating us to wound care, or was he rather challenging us to reimagine a world where there would be no more poor? Dr. Martin Luther King, in his speech, Beyond Vietnam, stated that we often pay more attention to the wounds of people than the conditions that harm them. Social justice is the ability to see more than the wounds. Social justice requires we ask the hard questions. What are people doing on this dangerous road? Why can't we ignore being on this kind of road? Is it possible for this road to be free of harm? So many of the givens in our lives today, we accept without imagining anything different. Does it really have to be this way? Do we really have to live in this state of racism and sexism and economic and social oppression? Social justice requires people who are willing and able to reimagine something different. Can we imagine what it would be for women to be seen in all their power and worth? Can we imagine available food for all of those who are hungry? Can we imagine a place where murder and harm and danger are unexpected, not the norms? Can we imagine a road where color and race and social status and sexual orientation and educational background are not factors in our well-being? What can this road called life look like for us, for our children, for our children's children? People of God, have we given up? Have we given up on ourselves? Have we given up on others? Have we given up on this world? Have we given up on what God had in mind? This Good Samaritan is named because it was expected that he would be the least likely to help. And we've carried this concept into our concept of ministry. And so we think wound care makes us stand out. We think that wound care is what gets the attention of God. But God wants us to reclaim our imagination of a world that is free of harm, a place where all of God's creation do not have to fight against extension and live in fear of being destroyed or alienated or negated or ignored. Can we reimagine a road where all along the road there's help for everybody? that there's abundance of what we need, where there is healing and there's hope. Can we imagine a road that is no longer a place of hurt and death, but rather a place of healing and wholeness? The text says in verse 30 that a man was going down from Jerusalem. 
he in essence is just leaving church, returning to the reality of living in an imperfect world. This verse struck me because it reminds us to secondly reimagine a road that goes in both directions. The Jericho Road goes in both directions. In this life, we seem to have forgotten that. Can we imagine a, wor a road that goes in both directions, where it's not this or that, us or them, up or down, black or white, church or world. The road goes in both directions. This road that ran between Jerusalem and the city of Jericho was only 20 miles, but it was a dangerous road that passed through a wilderness. The road was so dangerous that it was often called the bloody way because on the road, thieves and robbers would hide and wait for unarmed travelers to pass by so they could take their property and even their lives. The Jericho Road was well-traveled, people constantly moving between Jerusalem, the city of hope, and Jericho, the oasis in the desert. But Jerusalem is and was a lot of things. While it was a holy city, prophets were still killed in Jerusalem. And while Jericho was designed to be an oasis in the desert, it was still a terrible place of wilderness and desolation. The Jericho Road cannot be avoided. People are going in both directions. In this life, we are either going down from or we are ascending to, and we are vulnerable in both directions. Social justice requires transformation in both directions. But we have to reimagine a road that goes in both directions. We live in a world that focuses in one direction. We live in a world where we are so quick to take sides, so quick to assign blame, so quick to determine where our help and our concern needs to rest. But the road goes in both directions, coming and going, up and down, victims and victimizers. We have to reimagine a road where it's not this or that, but it's this and that. Jerusalem is important, but Jericho is important too. And often our prayers and our thoughts and our concerns on the road called life goes in only one direction. We have to speak, yes, truth to the powerful, but we have to also speak truth to the powerless as well. God is calling us to see again to reimagine a road that goes in both directions where men and women are constantly moving from the mountain to the valley, from the valley to the mountain. And no matter in what direction we are going, the road has to be transformed. To reimagine is to arm ourselves. We got to start packing, y'all. To arm ourselves, arm ourselves with wisdom and arm ourselves with accurate information and arm ourselves with real compassion that comes from the seat of our very soul and moves beyond past prejudices. To reimagine is to understand that no matter where the road is leading us, we still need God. From the deserts of life to the oasis we build for ourselves to the holy places we call church, we need God. To reimagine is to trust what we cannot always understand to trust what we cannot always see as possible, to reimagine is to see God on the road with us in all of our goings and comings and to know that if God is on the road, whether we're going down from or ascending up toward, it can still be a place of safety and a place of healing and a place of wholeness. I don't know why I feel like I'm straining. Give me a little bit more something. Is that all right? Finally, what I want to say tonight is, it has to be a road where we become neighbors. The story of the Good Samaritan begins with a question about eternal life. Who is our neighbor? Both of these are social justice questions because who we see as our neighbor has the potential to determine where we will spend eternal life. 
Who we see as our neighbor determines what we do on the road to make life better for others. Reimagining the Jericho Road is to reimagine a road where we all become neighbors. What would life be like if we reimagined one another, not as just fellow travelers, but neighbors? Not strangers that our lives just happen to touch on a daily basis, but neighbors. On this road called life that none of us can avoid and where we have to interact with one another, our safety on the road depends on how we see one another as stranger, as enemy, as friend, as neighbor. And it also depends on how we see ourselves as victim, as victimizer, as stranger, as friend, as neighbor, like the lawyer in the text. We too often find it difficult to identify those on the road with us as our neighbors. It's difficult to identify as neighbor those who don't look like us, who don't think like we do, who don't live where we live, who don't worship the God we worship, who don't wear the same educational, social, economic, spiritual garbs that we do. Whether we voice it or not, we too find ourselves asking, who? is my neighbor. Richard Niebuhr really challenged us when he defined neighbor as one we love to the extent that we can rejoice in their presence, that we desire that they be rather than not be, that they can be both our friends and our enemies, that both friends and enemies can now become our neighbors when we love them like that. The question for all of us tonight is can we reimagine a road where we become neighbors? Neighbors who are connected by common needs and hopes and dreams. Neighbors who are connected by a common purpose. Neighbors who are connected to, one, to the one who desires the best for all of us. Can we reimagine a road where we become neighbors to the extent that our acts of mercy and kindness and compassion are not transactional, but they are relational? That what we do for one another is simply because we are neighbors. The Good Samaritan saw, saw the person in need, saw, saw his need, and often we can't see we can't see past and we can't see beyond and we can't see through our own preconceived assigned value. Reimagining the Jericho Road is to reimagine that life can be a road where we are all valued as neighbors and we can rejoice in the presence of one another. A place where when we all show up in our authentic selves that our presence is not a problem. Anybody been somewhere but your presence is a problem? that just being there, that everybody around you lets you know that when you show up, it is problematic for them. But on this reimagined road where we are all neighbors, when we show up in our authentic selves, we are celebrated. And before we can transform or try to fix it, we have to reimagine a road that is radically different, a road that is harm-free, a road that goes in both directions, and a road where we become neighbors. And for those of us, I'm sure because we are ecclesiastical people and we're all so end time people, we're probably wondering, is it possible to live in a world that is harm free? Is it possible to live in a world where there is no hurt and there is no harm? Is it possible to live in a world well, we don't have to be afraid of one another. Is it possible to live in a world where we don't have to watch our back? Where are the temptations when you need? Just my imagination, just my imagination running away with me. But you know, it's more than my imagination. It's a vision of a God who desires more for us but also it's the vision of a God that desires more from us. The vision of a God who is with us on the road and a God who calls us to the road and reveals to us the possibilities of what the road can be. 
Reimagining is a call to find God in the midst of the journey and by faith to still dare to imagine a road that's free of pain, free of anxiety, and filled with peace and the power of our God. And so as we settle ourselves this week around the theme preaching and social justice, let us not forget that as preacher, we become the voice of God. We represent the God of all possibilities because God has always invited somebody to represent God's point of view, somebody to help the people see, somebody to help the people reimagine. And whether we want it or not, we are that somebody. We are those frail women and men that God has chosen, traveling the road, attacked on the road, bearing the wounds that we too have received along the way. But God calls us to open our eyes and to see, see more, see beyond, see in spite of, see greater, see what the people can't see. We have to reimagine the Jericho Road as a place of hope a place of peace, a place of possibilities, a place of joy, a place of healing, a place where we have not encountered anything like this before. We have to reimagine it so that together we can transform it. What do you see? That's the question tonight. What do you see, woman of God? What do you see, man of God? Do you see something different? Even in spite of the pain, do you see something different? Even in spite of what you're going through, do you see something different? Do you see something different in the faces of the people that you minister to each and every day? What do we see? As I take my seat, I want to share a story with you about reimagining the Jericho Road. On Easter Sunday, I went to worship with my daughter, my son-in-law, and my three-year-old, at that time, granddaughter. She was so excited. She's a talker. She was excited about being in worship. And from the time that we got in the church building, she was talking, she giggled, she danced, she clapped her hands, but she kept asking the same question over and over again. Her mom and dad tried to shush her, and the people around, they would laugh every time she would ask. But she wanted to know, when is God coming? And I was a little confused until the preacher who had been sitting on the front row mounted the steps and stood behind the pulpit and I realized that she was talking about the preacher. And what I saw in that Sunday morning display of childish excitement, childish expectation, was the promise of God showing up. And for those of us in this room who are preachers, I want us to understand that every time the congregation gathers, oh, they may not clap their hands and they may not dance around and they may not giggle with glee, but their question is the same question that my baby granddaughter wanted to know. When is God coming? When is God coming to see about me? When is God coming with some answers to my pain? When is God coming to show me the way out of my situation? When is God coming? And when you and I show up as frail men and women, broken and battered and needy ourselves, when we show up and humble ourselves before an awesome God, we become the greatest win, uh, witness and the symbol of God's presence wrapped in humanity. And while we are not God and they know that we are not God, we become the voice of God. When is God coming? When is God coming? When will we dare? 
to allow people to see something different. When is God coming? On Sunday, man of God, on Sunday, woman of God, people want to know when is God coming? Can you stand up and let me know that God wants us to see something different? That when we stand, can we stand with the power, in the power of God, helping the people to reimagine this Jericho Road? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That's why you come to Ellison. I want every student to stop and hear what just happened. The marriage of scholarship and spirit with a strong conviction of social transformation. That's why you come here. Can we give Queen Mother a tremendous? If you'll just give me two minutes, be seated for just a moment. We're getting ready to go. Um, they're going to sing us out, but I need to make some very quick announcements. Tomorrow, we start, we, we want to gather by 845 to begin worship. We have a full morning, and we're very excited about what God will do tomorrow. Uh, we're going to dig, dive very deeply into our theme. And so the encouragement, please get this, please, please, please understand. Showing up at 930, showing up at 10 o'clock, means that you're not really catching the spirit of this environment. Let's start together. Our preacher uh, will start, will begin, we will begin worship at 9, and our preacher will be up at no later than 9.15. We will, move, we will move into what will be a very incredible day. Um, on Wednesday, during lunch, we will have our John Kenny Hour. And, uh, and, and, and Dean Emeritus Kenny has been working with a group of students in the John W. Kenny uh, Center for a Transformative Leadership and Theology. And uh, so they will be presenting during lunch as well. One of our alumnus will be uh, sharing why seminary. Uh, tomorrow we will share a QR code with an article written by Dr. Miles Jones in 1973 entitled Why Black Seminary? And we will make it available to you to download if you've never read it. It's a classic piece. We shared it at Community Formation. Uh, tomorrow, following the faculty panel, we will have uh, a reception in Kingsley. And there, and it, if you've never been to Kingsley, uh, that's where we presently are. That's where we've been for a number of years. And that's where we presently are. You, you need to go to Kingsley. Just walk through it. You need to walk, go to Kingsley, just walk through it. We will have a reception. Now hear me. Here's what the reception going to be. A chicken wing. A swallow of something. Amen. Don't come hungry. Because you're going to be like that prince though to Jericho Road trying to reimagine lunch. I want to encourage you. I'm just saying, because you know black folk get real offended if they don't get a whole meal for a dollar. No, no, seriously, you need to go when, when it's over, because we have vendors over there. Uh, as well, our luncheon is Wednesday, and uh, for all of the alumni who, who would like to purchase a ticket, we'll, we'll be in place to do that tomorrow. Once we get to a number tomorrow afternoon, we will then open it up for our students to attend the luncheon for free. 
because we have paid for some slots and we will have some available and we'll have a system. And I would encourage you uh, to, as students, to, to sign up as quickly as possible, you know, once we can. I, I think the final thing is that God is, in, in our university, when, when there was a day that the School of Theology was a pathway to pulpits, um, one of the things we've been talking about in our dean's meeting led by our provost and our president is the importance of creating pathways. And so we are, God is blessing us to be able to do that. Out of nowhere, a young man, a young man came to me and said, Dean, I don't know where I'm going after, ch after I graduate. One of our alumni, Dr. Milner, out of Martinsville, reached out and said, Dean, I'm retiring, and I want to open up a door for a student here to fill in for me for the next six months. And God gave me an opportunity to point a young man who's looking for direction into a ministry opportunity. We have WeTap, and we're working diligently with, with, with the founder of WeTap, Dr. Goulchamp, to place women in pulpit opportunities. Amen. Well, one of our graduates, Dr. Brianna Parker, who's doing an amazing work, she has an incredible survey and study. She will be launching at her school tomorrow. Her church in Dallas, Texas, reached out to us and said, we would like to come to your school and do interviews on site for those who are interested in ministry assignments. And so there are four, pastor of worship, youth pastor, director of marketing, and children's pastor. They will be doing interviews for anyone who's interested in a position. And so if you're looking for somewhere to go and you're not sure where, this is going to be a, a, new, a, a new space for us. And so I'm praying that there will be other pastors when you start looking for positions or churches will come first to your school and say, can you create a space for us? to interview students that are looking for ministry opportunities. Can we give God praise? Antioch, the pastor, is a student of our school. So let's take this work seriously. All right, those are the church announcements. Everybody stand. No benediction. No benediction. No benediction until Friday. So here's how we're going to leave here. They're going to sing... And y'all going to greet each other. What time tomorrow? 845. 845. All right. I love you so much. Who are we? We are the School of Theology. We're the Samuel DeWitt Proctor School of Theology. Again, thank you, Provost. Can we celebrate our Provost one more time? And our Queen Mother. We'll see you tomorrow. Be blessed. Be safe. Let's fill this place up by tomorrow night. Precious Jesus, precious Jesus.